from whom we are going, and we, we are starting with Brave Man, who is going to give you live demonstration from Lumi. So hopefully, network will help us. Yes, uh, thanks for the brief introduction, and uh, good morning, everybody. So my name is uh, Lukas Prediger. I'm a machine learning specialist at CSC, and I guess we have all seen that slide before yesterday. So at CSC, um, we are charged with running the Finnish national superclusters, but we also host uh, Lumi on behalf of the Lumi consortium uh, right there in uh, Kajaani in the middle of Finland. And uh, so we do this on behalf of the Lumi consortium, which means also on, on behalf of you, because you have a share in that. And therefore, I'm here today to talk briefly about um, yeah, how to get a machine learning uh, training workload running with PyTorch on, on Lumi. And I brought an example for that, uh, which, which will be we're going to do some fine tuning of a GPT Neo language model. I, I think I only have the laser pointer, so I guess I just show on both sides so everyone can see what I'm pointing at. So we will fine tune that, that language model uh, on some IMDB movie review data to basically get a model to generate us some movie reviews. Not that there would be much point to that, but like as a toy exercise for this example. Um, I'll be using uh, the, the model, the data set, and also uh, software libraries basically all coming from huggingface.co, um, which for those who don't know is like a very popular repository for these models and um, basically builds on top of PyTorch with, with a few convenience wrappers. Uh, the model itself has 1.37 uh, billion parameters, and on on our uh, VRAM, it will be taking up about like 2.7 gigabytes in 16-bit uh, floating point representation, and the data set has about 100,000 reviews of varying length, out of which 25,000 are reserved for testing, so we have like 75,000 reviews to train on. Um, all the scripts I will be showing later are available at this uh, GitHub repository, so if you want to to follow along or just snark at my code, uh, feel free to, to have a look at that. So for getting there, we need to, of course, uh, consider how Lumi is different from, from other systems, and that uh, means, I guess, your, your desktop or your, your laptop, but also maybe other supercomputing clusters you already know. And of course, um, the first thing is, which is common for, for all the uh, for all the supercomputing clusters, I said this is, of course, a, a massive system with lots and lots of computing components, and this is also shared with a lot of other users. So we need a way to, uh, for every user to allocate resources in the system and start their runs in a, in a way that guarantees that everybody who is supposed to run on the system can run without interfering with, with the others. And um, as, a, as a difference from, from other clusters, of course, we have the uh, point that Lumi is uh, running on AMD hardware, including the GPUs, and therefore also using the, the AMD software stack and not CUDA. And the final thing is that in Lumi we have only uh, network storage, we have no local storage, so this is also something we will need to consider. So with all these things in mind, I will like, give a bit more background before actually going into the, the coding part, but first about Lumi itself, so I think we also briefly saw this slide already yesterday. This is a single uh, compute knot, or I guess a blade, in the Lumi G, so the Lumi GPU partition, and it has like one 64-core uh, AMD processor, and for technical reasons, only 56 cores are actually usable of that. And then we also have four AMD MI250X GPUs, which, um, Actually, each of those comes with two chips, which AMD calls graphics compute dice, and for the purposes of Lumi, these are PS8 different GPUs in the, in the Slurm system. And uh, of these, we have like almost 3,000 nodes, which gives us a total of almost 24,000 GCDs in total to run our things on. And yeah, so then, then breaking this down a bit, uh, if, we, if we look at, if we want to have one G GCD and uh, share everything else fairly, that would give us roughly seven cores and up to 64 gigabits of RAM and VRAM. 
um, uh, yeah, for every GCD. And I'm saying up to because there's of course like a small, small fraction of the RAM is used by the system. So if you try to get 64 gigabyte on a NOT for each GCD, you will not quite get it, but you can get very close. So uh, this is uh, the system, and then as I already said, uh, Rockham is not CUDA. So unfortunately, um, all the major machine learning uh, libraries were uh, built pretty much initially for CUDA. And um, AMD has, has done now a lot of work to basically port all of them so that they can use Rockham as well. And they nowadays claim that uh, PyTorch, for example, as a popular framework is, is very much supported out of the box, which uh, I guess is true on most systems, but unfortunately not quite on Lumi. Uh, very briefly about that later. Uh, and the same is kind of true for like a lot of these uh, many popular ML specific libraries like Flash Attention, Bits and Bytes and VLLM and, and all the latest and greatest stuff. Uh, these are all ported to, to Rockham now, but on Lumi we still have, uh, we, we still observe uh, like so, some bugs and rough, rough edges, mostly um, pertaining to the configuration so that we make use of the system efficiently. And often we can fix these by tweaking some uh, environment variables. But the main problem I guess we currently have is that our uh, AMD drivers are actually somewhat outdated, so all the latest versions are a bit tricky to get running. However, we will be uh, getting an, a system upgrade soon, and last I heard was somewhere, somewhere in July, so hopefully then we will have uh, like a lot newer drivers and will be uh, running things a lot easier. So with, uh, with that out of the way, how now does uh, using a supercomputer, or specifically Lumi, uh, look like? And I guess if you have used a supercomputer before, this is not really new for you. But first thing is that we uh, connect to the system, and uh, Pear mentioned yesterday that uh, it's now very popular to do so through uh, the web interface, but uh, I like fiddling with SSH keys, so I will be using the terminal for that. Um, and once we have connected, we will prepare the software and data we want to uh, run and run on, and then set up our, um, our Slurm batch job template where we say what res resources do we want, what software models do we want to load, and what do we actually want to run. And then we submit this uh, script so that it actually runs on the compute node. So let's briefly step through that. So first we need to uh, figure out where to put our data. And in Lumi we have a couple of locations for every project that you um, or that you are a part of. So every project has um, a folder in slash project slash the project, project name. And this is really where you should put like all your code and software installations. Because, so this is shared um, among all, all people collaborating on a project. So whatever one person puts there, everyone can, can access. Uh, then there's the, the scratch folder, which I guess is, uh, this should be very familiar to, to people who have used a system like this before, so this is really basically where the data you compute on and the result of your computation should go. So this is like a, a large, uh, uh, a large storage for like all intermediate results. For example, in machine learning, it would be your training data, it would be your your model checkpoints, and of course, the finally trained model. We also have uh, something which is called flash storage, which is uh, exactly what it actually claims to be, so this, this scratch store is backed by actual hard drives, the flash storage is uh, solid state drives. And if you have uh, very I.O. heavy things, or, or when you need to load data quickly, you have the flash storage, and, which gives you a lot more bandwidth, but it's also much smaller, so there's a bit of a trade-off there. In general, uh, to consider is that, as I already mentioned, uh, Lumi has only network storage, there is no, no local storage in the nodes, and uh, the, the network storage is, is a Luster file system, and that consists of uh, a metadata server and object storage servers. And every time you access a file, you first hit the metadata storage and, well, get some metadata, and which, which tells you like the file name, file size, permissions, but also uh, where to get the actual data from, which are then the, the object storage servers. Um, and if you access one file, that's all very nice and fine, but if you uh, have a lot of small files and you try to access a lot of them all at once, 
uh, then you end up really bottlenecking with the metadata server and um, that affects not only your own I.O. performance but also that of everybody else simply because then this uh, metadata server becomes a bottleneck. So as a rule of thumb on this cluster, uh, please avoid creating and accessing large amounts of small files. It will really uh, deteriorate the I.O. performance for, for everybody. Um, so with the, since we now know uh, where we can store things, uh, let's, let's start setting up our software environment for running. And well, as the title says, we want to run PyTorch. So how do we get PyTorch on Lumi? Well, I guess the first instinct might be, well, we can just visit pytorch.org and it will give us this like, nice, uh, nice, matrix, nice matrix here where we can uh, choose uh, what kind of options we want to have. So we're on an AMD system. And then this website will say, okay, please run this pip command uh, and you will get PyTorch. Please don't do that. Um, there, are, there are two problems with this. The first is like this, this big red text here. So if you uh, try to do this, this will try to install PyTorch build against Rockham 5.7, which is not compatible with the current drivers on Lumi. It will uh, also uh, not set up a lot of the configuration to make use of the uh, specific slingshot interconnect. So then you would get a not very good performance on, uh, for, for multi-node runs. The other problem is that uh, pip and especially conda installation uh, tend to create a lot of small files and we just learned that that's a bad thing to do. So for example, for, this, uh, for the example that I brought, this is like a, a minimal setup uh, in, in a conda file with like all the uh, packages we need to run this and only installing this and of course its subdependencies will give us uh, about 50,000 files, all of which are very small Python scripts. So this is something that Luster really doesn't like. Uh, so instead, what we recommend to do on Lumi is uh, use a container, especially like a singularity container, which will wrap uh, all these codes into like a single file for the purposes of the Luster file system. Um, so do you have to build this container yourself? Uh, no, you don't. Uh, we have actually currently at least one too many ways to install PyTorch on Lumi actually. Uh, for this example, I'll be using a module that we provide from CSC. Um, and you can get it by using these two commands. First one instructs the module system to look at the local CSC provided installations and then simply load the module. And this gives you a singularity container with PyTorch properly set up. And it also gives you wrappers for the container so you don't even need to worry about running in a container. You can just use a Python command and it will actually step into the container for you. Uh, it also comes with many common machine learning libraries, which we already bundled in there. But if you notice that you will need to install additional packages via pip, you can actually create like a virtual environment. Just make sure to also include this uh, dash dash system side packages so that you get the PyTorch that is uh, already coming with the module. Uh, of course, keeping in mind what I said before, Please do this only for like a small number of additional packages. If you really need a large custom install, then we really need to uh, get you your own container for that. And um, yeah, for, for that, so, so as I said, this module is provided by, by CSC specifically. There are also, let's say, more official ways from the uh, Lumi user support team um, for installing your own PyTorch container, which uses a uh, Singularity container directly provided by AMD, which is arguably a bit more performant, but maybe a bit trickier to set up. We are hoping to kind of streamline the process in the future and kind of bring, bit, bring together the best of those two, but we are not quite there yet, unfortunately. But yeah, for the purposes of this, uh, this talk, I will be using this, uh, this CSC container. Uh, so now we kind of have our PyTorch installation there. Uh, so let's, let's run something and let's first start by running on a single GPU or GCD. So we will be out of all the eight GPUs on a not we will be using one. And well, if you were now to run on your, on your own computer, then you could just uh, punch in a Python, the name of your script and that would run. Uh, but unfortunately not so on, on Lumi. As I said already, this is a massively shared system. And uh, when you connect to it, you first actually connect to uh, what is called a login node, and that's where your terminal is when you log in. 
and the login lot is uh, not for heavy computation. And if you just uh, type this into this into your terminal on the login node, it will try to run on the login node, and uh, the login node does not have a GPU, so you will be spending lots of time, and you will also draw the anger of our admins probably. So instead, we uh, we use Slurm to reserve some resources and then submit scripts uh, to run actually on the on the compute nodes and get all the GPUs we want. So how do we do that? So we set up uh, this, uh, this Slurm batch script, and if you now follow along with the GitHub repository, this is the run.sh, and uh, in there we first specify what kind of resources do we want to have. So in this case, we want one GPU, we want to run one process, and we will be using seven, seven CPUs per process, which if you remember the earlier slide is kind of the fair share uh, you get for one. GPU, and then I also said we want to have 60 gigabytes, which is probably a bit overkill for this example, but uh, we might as well. Uh, so, so this instructs the Slurm system, like what resource do you want? The next part is then uh, basically what we already looked at. So this is uh, loading the, the PyTorch module from provided by CSC. And if you have, uh, if you have created your own VM, you can like source it here as well so that you get the additional packages you installed. And yeah, then in the end you just, uh, then you finally punch in your Python my script, but you prefix it also with, uh, with this tiny S run there, which will actually run it then on the compute nodes. Um, yeah, very briefly about the GP. So there's a couple of, of different partitions uh, on, Lumi, and for this example, since we only want one GCD, we're using the small g partition, which allows us to uh, reserve at the level of individual GCDs. There's also standard g, but this is only if we want to get whole nodes all at once. And then for debugging, there's also def g. But yeah. Uh, so yeah, with that script set up, then if we actually want to run the stuff on the cluster now, we uh, just say, we just enter the command s batch, and then our our batch scripts are run.sh, and uh, now, now comes the fun part. I do have a terminal right here, so this is on Lumi now. I am in the project folder of a project that I'm using for this, and uh, maybe I can zoom this in a bit. And yeah, so, so here you can basically see it now all the scripts that are included in the, in the repository and that there's this run, run.sh, uh, which looks very similar to what I've been showing on the slides earlier. Um, there's a bit of uh, script specific setup here. So this is basically setting uh, a bunch of, of paths where we want our data and our cache data to end up. And, uh, as you can see, I pointed them all to scratch in this case. And then in the end, we uh, run uh, Python with this PyTorch IMDB GPT script and give it some, some arguments. For example, we tell it like for the num number of workers, we just uh, basically use the number of, of CPUs we have reserved for this job. So we have a live demo effect. <laughs> uh, I tried to quit this, but now we have to wait a bit, which sometimes happens on Lumi when the file system is having a bad day. Um, let's get back to that in a minute or so, and I will uh, keep going through the slides. Once you have started a job, which I hope we can do soon, <laughs> Uh, there are like a couple of handy commands to check what your job is currently doing. So you can uh, check the, the queue, which uh, will tell you like, is your job already running? Is it uh, still in the queue and waiting for resources to be allocated? And uh, if so, how long? Um, if you want to see the output of the job that usually gets forwarded in, uh, in a file that has the like dating scheme, slurm, dash, and then the number of the submitted job which uh, the sbatch command, if we briefly go back, it, it tells you like this number after you submit it. And uh, if you also notice that something is going wrong with your job, you can always cancel it. Let's maybe briefly see. Yes, we are back. So as I said, um, if we want to run this now, we would just uh, 
type as patterns in the name of our script. And uh, this is actually something I forgot because today I have to today I have the advantage that for this demo I will I have a reservation and for that I need to actually use the standard G instead of the small G. So now uh, now we have the jobs submitted. So if we now check the SQ, so it's a bit hard to. Uh, to type one-handed. But yeah, so, so it shows like we're already running for 13 seconds now and uh, we can now, uh, sorry. I need a typist up here. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, as you see, you see nothing, uh, which is uh, usually it takes a bit to, to get going to load all these software. So we have like a bit, bit of a gap here until it really starts doing things. Um, how are we doing on time actually? Not six minutes. I was about to show you the code of the actual script uh, just to convince you that there's no fanciness going on there. Uh, but maybe I don't have the time for that. But it's 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 uh, it's, it's a very standard uh, PyTorch training script. So there's nothing Lumi specific going on in there. Just loads some data, loads the model, and sets up a training. Um, maybe what what I can briefly mention. Yeah, I, I just mentioned without going to the code now. So, so we're using for that a batch size of uh, of 32 examples in a batch, which just about fits on on one GCD for that. Um, and in the interest of time, let's not wait for that. I can tell you that running this now for 1,000 iterations will take about 25 minutes. Uh, as we just heard, we have not that much time left. So uh, let's try to to speed it up. So of course we have uh, lots of GCDs available. So uh, let's grab all of them that we can get on a single node. And here's the changes to the um, to the HBS S batch script for that. So now we officially go to the standard G because we want to reserve a full node. Uh, we grab all the GPUs, we grab one task per GPU and um, and we also just grab all the memory available on the knot. The loading part of the, of the software, so the PyTorch model, that doesn't change. Um, but now we need to tell our script, and which is using the hugging face uh, trainer, uh, which in the, under the hood uses uh, PyTorch distributed. So we need to tell that how to connect to the other, uh, to the other processes running. And this we achieve by just setting these environmental variables. So the first one is basically we tell um, each script that it should connect to the to the first rank uh, process we are running, and then we also tell it um, how many processes there are in total. And then in the end, we also need to modify the S run command a bit so that it uh, evaluates like these these variables, which are now specific to the eight processes we run, uh, only inside this S runs. But, but that is how we tell each process basically, like which, which process am I. Um, and do we also need to change the code for that? Well, actually, as I already said, the Transformers trainer automatically reads this world size and rank to set up all the connectivity between the uh, processes. And this is uh, also somewhat similar for other frameworks. Many of them just use the PyTorch distributed under the hood. Uh, but if you use this, directly, so if you're not using any fancy framework on top of, of PyTorch, then you need to uh, add this, this line where you tell it, okay, this is where I now want to, to read these environmental variables and set up the connectivity. And you would also need to wrap your model in like a custom class, but there's, that's kind of all the changes. Uh, another change I made is to also read the, the world size and adjust so the, the number of processes we have, and then in, in the script adjust the batch size so that, that we split the batch uh, across the eight devices 
to achieve like data parallel training. So each G GPU will have a copy of the model, but run only through one eighth of the batch, which uh, should give us a nice speed up. And I guess we're running quite low on time, so I'm not sure if I can actually show this now. Um, so, so much for the live demo part, unfortunately. But I can tell you that if we now were to run this, and uh, so with this modified script, so now we would just say uh, we want to as batch run multi GPU. Um, we will get our running time from the initial about 25 to 30 minutes to like about nine. So we're not getting eight fold speed up, but we do get some speed up. One thing I haven't glimpsed, I have glimpsed over so far is, uh, uh, can be seen from, from this image, which shows you that each of the GCDs on a knot, so this is again a single knot, and each of, each of the GCDs is directly connected to a certain subset of cores on the GPU, and you will get the most, most performance for transferring data from CPU to GPU if the process that is using this uh, GCD is, using, is, is running on the CPU cores on the CPU side. And uh, you can instruct Slurm to set this up with this like somewhat cryptic CPU bind mask. There's not really anything to think about here. This is just something you need to copy paste. Uh, but it will give you this, this setup so that all the CPUs communicate with the, so all the, uh, every process using a GPU is uh, bound to the CPU cores that are closest to it. In this example, I haven't actually seen any benefit from that, but this is because we are, uh, I guess, very GPU compute bound here and have only very little data, so there's uh, not, we are not really bottlenecked by CPU GPU transfers in this case, but AMD people tell me that in other cases this can be very, uh, very crucial for good performance and it doesn't really hurt in any case, so we can just like always drop this in our, our scripts. Uh, for the last one and a half minutes, what if we now want to go to, to more? Not, well, we don't really have to change much anymore. We have everything set up, so now we can just modify our script and say, we want all the things we had before, but please give us two nuts. And uh, all, all, the, all the rest, the setup of like which, where the processor should connect to it stays the same. And if we were now to run that, we see that nothing really changes anymore. Um, so of course now that we are not using eight GPUs within a single knot, which can communicate very quickly, but we have to go across a network. Um, we get uh, quite, quite a jump in uh, communication overhead. And, um, and also since the batch size per device is now becoming very small with only two examples, uh, like we kind of underutilizing the GPUs a bit in this case. So we have kind of reached the limit of scaling for this example. Of course, what we can do now, and very easily, is to just increase our total batch size, for example, to 64, which brings us, uh, which brings each GCD in this case back to the same amount of data processing as in this case, and the runtime wouldn't actually much change then. So, so we still would get like about this 590 seconds, but we would then process double the amount of data. But of course, this is we have to think about: is this something we want to do? Because of course, it will affect the model a bit if we change how much data we ingest. Very, very briefly, um, of course, data parallelism has its limit, as we just saw. Also, there's a problem if your model itself doesn't fit into a single GPU. We have to look at other ways of parallelism, and uh, in this case, model parallelism, so we split the model over different GPUs. There are different ways of doing that. We can either split every layer across different GPUs, or we can uh, split the uh, distribute the layers over pipelines. Um, I'm not gonna go into details about this, but there are frameworks that do that and you can also use them on Lumi. I skipped this one. Uh, I also skipped this one. So there is, uh, the Lumi web interface actually has a tensor board for, for ease of use. So if you want to track your runs, you can log in on uh, lumi.csc.fi and very easily start a tensor board there to see what your training runs are doing. Uh, let me finish with um, this, this announcement. So we will be having a Moving Your AI Training Jobs to Lumi workshop. Uh, the first iteration of this is 
end of next month in Copenhagen and is unfortunately already fully booked. But uh, we are planning a second iteration of that, or like, so this is with uh, Lumi user support. Uh, we're planning a second iteration of this here in the Czech Republic sometime in November, where we will go into like basically all these topics, but with a lot more detail. And it's a two-day workshop. So if, if this is interesting to you, watch out for the announcement of that on the uh, Lumi website. So that, that brings me to, to the end. Sorry for going a bit over time. Um, but yeah, if you need to check, want to check the documentation here, the links, and if you have questions, I guess, either now or later or by email to me. Thank you. So we may have a time just for one question. Any, any burning question? If not, we yes. can, yeah. Uh, does the Lumi provide any telemetry or monitoring for the for the user? Well, for example, if I run the computation job on the computation node, uh, is it is there a possibility to uh, get some uh, telemetry data from the computation node for maybe some optimization of my code? Uh, I guess we. It depends a bit on on the level of, of detail you need there. You can of course use the PyTorch profiler to get a lot of information uh, about like where your particular bottlenecks might be. There are also commands where you can just easily connect to. Um, let me briefly go back here. So with uh, with this command, you can connect to to a node and check like how well are the GPUs utilized at this particular moment. Okay, so we will thank our speaker again, and we can switch to the second presentation. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so my name is Milan Danecek, I'm coming from Sasnet, and I would like to uh, show you a bit uh, of the practical use cases for using object storage for computational data. I have also very short and simple demo for you. So uh, let me start with our infrastructure. Uh, so, Sysnet is operating uh, currently uh, several clusters, all distributed within Czech Republic. Uh, currently, we have uh, hierarchical storage uh, with type libraries and disk, disk arrays, and we are in the phase of renewing our data storage and coming to the uh, object storage, as object storage will be the only uh, storage which we will provide for the future due to uh, many operational consequences, <laughs> let's say. Uh, currently, we have about 120 petabytes of physical space in total, but uh, of course, it's the raw capacity and the user capacity due to redundancy is slightly lower. Uh, in the organizational point of view, uh, all storage are operated within the community, uh, stored in Czech Republic under local jurisdiction, so we are not uh, having any uh, scientific data abroad, like in some commercial providers. And we uh, state that the data always belongs to the originators. Uh, so current state is that we have still uh, in operation the hierarchical storage with the tape library and disk arrays. All these uh, storages uh, will be in operation until the end of 2024. We hope, and we now in the state of migration of the user data to the <coughs> object storage systems. Uh, the second part, now we have already five clusters of object storage uh, distributed uh, in Czech Republic uh, with the 120 petabytes of capacity. And these storages will be uh, later on continuously uh, renewed 
because we don't want to face the migration of the data from one system to other system. So we will continuously uh, renew the infrastructure with, uh, let's say, minimal effect uh, on the users. So our object storage is based on the Ceph technology. We provide elementary services, S3, RBD, and Ceph as uh, For the computation use case, uh, it's mostly uh, S3, uh, where this is the transition from the common uh, NFS mounts in the, in the computational nodes, uh, where we'll be also focused the demo later. Uh, the clusters are distributed across Czech Republic, so we can use a kind of uh, geographical optimization for the data location, so you can uh, store your data close to the computational nodes where you want to perform the computation. And uh, the elementary use cases, as I said, is for the S3, uh, which the S3 uh, can be used for the staging to the, to the user directory or to the scratch, respectively. Or uh, another use case is the S3, uh, using S3 protocol for ingesting to the data repositories and the further processing. So S3 is very simple uh, HTTPS protocol which can be easily included in, in your job script. Uh, where for the demo, uh, I use the S5 CMD, uh, S3 client, but you can use also R clone. All these uh, S3 clients are available in the uh, computational nodes of Metacentrum and 94i. Uh, so you can very easily stage uh, the data which you stored in the S3 in Cessnet to the directory, to the data there, prior to computation, and perform the computation, and then stage out the data back to uh, S3 directory, oh, S3 service, sorry. So uh, here is time for demo. Uh, the demo is uh, prepared in the Metacentrum infrastructure, but the similar usage can be, uh, can be used also in the IT4I environment. So I would like to ask my colleague to play the video. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thank you. So I have prepared some uh, some input data uh, in Cessna S3. So this is just quick check that the input file is ready. So now I will log in into the Metacentrum front end and prepare the job script. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> so now a successful login. So now I'm logging in the front end. So now let's review a bit the very simple example job script. So, uh, here you can see there is some definition of the of the directories of the credentials for the S5 CMD tool. Uh, you can store the the credentials in the user folder. Uh, what do you prefer? Then there is a command, simple command of the S5 CMD where I will stage the S3 data to the to the data there. There is some body of the computational script itself. Very simple, just to process some uh, file with the Gaussian calculation. So after the processing, there is again the stage out script for S5 CMD, where I will take the output file and I will stage it out to the to the S3 and clean the scratch. So now I can submit uh, my job. It's very simple, very fast calculation. It's just to demonstrate. Uh, the usability of S3 protocol within the calculation. So now it's being submitted. So the job is running now. So now 
log out and I will check my, uh, my S3 storage again, whether the file is already present after the calculation. Let's wait a few seconds. See, and the result is already there. So uh, I have the HQO out file with the, from the finished calculation. So that's it. Can I ask to continue the presentation? So this is the simple simple demo how to use the how to use the S3 staging uh, into computational node and out. Okay, so now let me move a bit uh, to the data repositories. Uh, basically, repository is the storage where you store the data with metadata equipped with some fancy user interface. Uh, you heard a lot about this yesterday, mainly for the David Antosh uh, presentation about the national data infrastructure. Currently, we have the prototype of uh, data repository. Uh, which is proof of concept of the national repository platform in corresponding project. Uh, the records are curated by the National Library of Technology, uh, mostly to gain the experience with the, with the data, with the records, because the user creativity is uh, very complex, let's say. Uh, also, the storage can be used as a for, for long-term data storage, so we uh, assume that the data will stay as they are, where they are, and the interfaces, procedures uh, may be changed, or the, uh, the graphic user interface will be also slightly changed, but the data will still be accessible, available, including the persistent identificators and so on. So the data maturity for the repository, uh, so uh, some colleagues will hate me for this, but <laughs> We still uh, saying that the data which are being stored in the data repository should be uh, more or less finalized, so only with the minor changes. Uh, of course, you can uh, upload also raw, raw data, raw data for the for the processing. There's no limitation technically for this, but it's about the reasonable cost-effective estimation. If you really need to store in the repository. Uh, 15, 20 versions of the same data, which the usable uh, data set will be only one. Always needs some reasonable estimation. Uh, also, the repository for these use cases support the versioning, uh, where you can have more versions of the same data set while keeping the, the persistent DOI. Uh, of course, when you want to store something to the repository, you always need to equip the, even the raw data with the, with the metadata. This is crucial for the data repository. So, uh, prior to ingesting, you should also think uh, about the granularity of your data, which this also uh, this is also related to the future usage because if you will uh, put 50 terabytes uh, data sets where the, for the analysis you need only one terabyte later on, so you will much more uh, complicate the future working with these data sets, not only for you but also for the other users because you need to download this huge data set, then extract only some small part for the calculation or analysis and then process it. So this is also very important to think before you uh, do the ingesting. Uh, same like I presented before, uh, data repository uh, will uh, allow you to ingest the data for the computational nodes. So you can stage in the data from the repository very easily because the repository is built upon S3 uh, uh, storage. So you can use very similar uh, commands for the stage in. Uh, the only things, there must be some workflow, workflow behind where you need to translate the DOI to S3 pre-signed URL to, st uh, to stage in only particular directory or file. The very fancy things on this S3 protocol is that you 
uh, always when you stage in the data or stage out the data, you always communicate only with uh, S3 endpoint. You don't communicate with the server where the repository is running. So you are enhancing the, the throughput of, the, of this data. Um, so this is also the, the, the throughput is also very highly related to the granularity of the data because if you need to stage incredible amount of data while you need only very small part, then the effectiveness of your work and of your calculation is much more lower. For staging out uh, to the repository, this is, uh, this is of course technically possible, but uh, you need to think that again, the data after the calculation must be equipped with the metadata for staging out. So you have to get also this uh, consideration for your computation workflow. Uh, so this is, this is the demonstration of the uh, graphical user interface ingest to the data repository. Very simple formula where you can fill the, the metadata like the, uh, the title, uh, language, abstract, authors, licenses, institutions, and so on and so on in uh, several steps. Then the last step is to upload uh, is to upload the data. So you will grab the data from your from your computer and you will upload it and create the record. Uh, the ingest is also possible uh, using API. Uh, it's very simple. You just need to have the user token. So if you have user token, then you can use, for instance, here the uh, curl. Uh, call for the creation of the of the record so once you create the record with similar cooler you can uh, you can edit it you can uh, upload the data you can um, uh, step uh, forward like to send the record for the to the creator for the publication and so on so this i just try to upload uh, to create some draft and then i just check it in the user, uh, graphic user interface and you can edit it via automated way, very easily, very simple. So uh, let me summarize. So we provide uh, uh, storage services uh, for computational data, uh, mainly is based on S3 protocol for stage out staging. Uh, we have some use cases, very special use cases with uh, CFFS, uh, which is not commonly available service, but uh, we can, uh, we always try to satisfy any user with any request, so we are looking even for some specialized uh, solutions for the users and user communities. Um, so the stage out can be done in the manual ways, like you can, you can uh, log in into the uh, a computational front end, you can manually stage out the data or you can uh, stage the data with the automated way, you can put it uh, the corresponding commands in the job script so you can run all in automated way. Same like for the repositories, uh, you can also use it for stage out and stage in. Uh, here you have always to think that uh, the, your calculation must also produce uh, the corresponding metadata with, uh, with the model metadata model which you want to uh, ingest the record and also for the for the data repository you can use a graphic user interface to stage it uh, to stage it in or in the api access so i think that's my last slide yeah thank you for attention so this presentation was faster than expected so we have a Enough time for questions. If nothing is burning, uh, we have a few questions in Slido. First was, uh, if you, you said that we, you have uh, the object storage is CL1 to CL5, and uh, when, when we, you, we, you will be doing upgrades, the, it will be invisible for the people because you will be just upgrading rack by rack. Yes. But do you guarantee that data will not move between the repositories? For some reason, or uh, 
Yes, this is always very hard to very hard to predict uh, because we consider that the upgrade will brings also will bring also slight uh, increase of the capacity. Uh, but let's say if the user has or the community has the data which are continuously growing, there may be uh, this possibility that some part of the of this community data could be uh, on different data storage. But this always depends on the situation. So the next question if, uh, is whether, whether you are able to provide pre-signed URLs. Uh, you said yes, but whether they are persistent or not. Pre-signed URLs are persistent as long as they exist. So if you... Oh, I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? I'm not sure what, what, what was the point of, for the question, if someone can give us more details now. And the second one was, uh, we, can, we already said this. <laughs> the, the question is if, if, they, if, if, if when, you, when you said that you, you are preparing the data, uh, in, and, and storing them to the to, to repository, whether you allow some sharing of uh, this, let's say, w one metadata or w one data part, which can be used by different people from, from the same group, or whether they can store, you can create object, yeah. in, in object store, just one object which is used by several people to, to push data there from more than one location or more than one job? And then how this, is this will always leads done? to the modification of the of the record. So if you push the data once, you create the record. The record is in the state of draft. And if you put another data, you will make another version of the data and so on and so on. So, so uh, and the record is just once one one push. No no. You, you can yes. you can push more more than once yes. and then say that's it. Yes. That's all my data. Yes. So is there any possibility that two different people will store <laughs> parts of this data? Uh, yes, the possibility is there, but uh, since you, it's for a bit wider discussion. The repository allows to use the community. The community always consisting of more uh, users. <laughs> If this user creates the record, as long as the record is as draft, the other users cannot see it, so cannot modify. If the user already uh, Close it. go forward, then it comes to another role, which is called curator. Curator can uh, review the record, can modify or something, or give it back to the to the user, and basically you cannot have for one record five users currently. Yes, uh, maybe I can clarify the question, even though it's not my question, but I maybe understand which direction it's going, because uh, it can be the access management, and if there will be enabled some kind of collaborative environment so that you can specify when you upload the data set, this uh, kind of raw data you mentioned, I think, I would expect this question is going this direction, that you allow other colleagues via the AAI, you know, uh, account that they can modify the access and in the repository you will have some time frame in which you still don't consider it as closed as this closed data set which you version as version one or something. So I think this is question about access policy or kind of uh, possibility that you specify your colleagues still uploading data because if you have some questionnaires collecting in one month and you already want to upload some kind of information there and you want to continuously edit, you will close it after some time frame, maybe? Yeah, this should be possible. Like if you have the users within the community, like the group namespace, so then the more user can see it and can edit the, the record. 
Well, I can probably clarify because uh, what Milan was actually describing is current implementation in the Kachul repository, and uh, this was absolutely correct. Uh, you can create a record in the repository, and you are the owner of the record until you finish the record, and then it gets to another part of, of processing, which currently means that it's checked by our colleagues from the National uh, Library of Technology, which is set up in this way just to learn how people are able to, to cope with uh, uh, filling in metadata and so on. This is not the final state of the infrastructure. Uh, first, I, uh, I expect that we will drop the step uh, of, the, of the checking by, by our colleagues because it becomes unsustainable. Second, uh, in uh, actual specialized repositories, there will be a process defined how a record can be, uh, can be created. And it will also include that you have a group of users that is able to, to collect the data for the record and it does not depend on a timeout, it doesn't make sense. It will, it will most likely depend on uh, some of them just submitting the record for further processing. So uh, if you have the data that you, that you are collecting over time, this will definitely be possible to do in an unfinished record in, into a repository. Is that clear now? I, I hope. No. <laughs> Still have a time for last question? Maybe. No. So there, there's a question. If I now have in a batch script for Metacentrum just CP from some storage to scratch, uh, what is the minimal replacement for using S3? Because you had there like a whole page of code, which, which sounds quite a user-unfriendly replacement for one command. Uh, so, it depends. You have the data currently where? Then, like some... No, if, uh, no, I have it on, on normal storage like as a part of a cluster. But when I have it on uh, uh, this uh, new S3 storage... Yeah, and? And then what, like, what is uh, the minimal replacement for CP? Is it just uh, this uh, S3 CMD? Uh, yes, you can uh, always depends on the, what is uh, available on the computational node, but I think by default there is a S5 CMD, which is for large uh, data sets or R clone. But of course, all of these uh, S3 clients need some certain configuration because you need to put the, first of all, you have to get the account, S3 account, so you need to get the access key and secret key. And also for the S5 CMD, yeah, you need uh, to define some like a size of chunks because the S5 CMD is made for the large data. So and the uh, the clients can cut your data into several chunks and make a multi-part upload. So it's uh, enhancing the the throughput to the to the data storage. But yes, it's not like uh, replacing one SCP command. Uh, you need to do a bit of magic. But we have quite nice uh, uh, tutorials in our websites, so I, I bet that you can do it very easily. If, if, if your environment is already prepared, you have an object store created, account created, story, credential stored co correctly, it's just instead of copy, you will call S5 command something, and that's it. At the end. So this ends this presentation. Thanks, speaker, again. Thank you. And we are moving to the sensitive. Okay, uh, thank you for coming. My name is Michal Ružička. I'm from uh, CERIT uh, CS at Masaryk University. 
and uh, I'm going uh, to tell you uh, about uh, current and possible future uh, possibilities for uh, sensitive data handling in uh, infra CZ. Uh, I'm afraid there is no, yeah, yeah there is a laser, laser pointer too. So, uh, first a bit about our motivation. Uh, I think there are two main uh, main buzzwords in uh, data world uh, now. It's uh, open science or uh, open data and uh, fair data. That's uh, one uh, important aspect uh, we, are, we have in our mind when uh, handling uh, data at uh, our university and uh, what uh, we are going to uh, do also uh, for uh, Infra CZ. Uh, you, uh, you probably know that uh, security, data security is uh, still more and more important. Uh, at our university, we have a uh, facu uh, medical faculty, we have uh, institutes like uh, SATEC, Recetox, etc., that are working with uh, sensitive data from medical environments, uh, for, for example. And uh, we have to do something uh, with their data in the light of uh, open science and uh, fair data handling. Uh, so uh, we need some infrastructure where uh, we can uh, store uh, the data, uh, we can uh, provide access to the data, but uh, just uh, to the selected users that are allowed uh, to see and uh, manipulate uh, with the data somehow. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we need to uh, fulfill also other aspects uh, like uh, proper, uh, proper metadata, uh, uh, track of uh, the data handling uh, with uh, provenance information, etc. Et uh, at uh, this uh, point, uh, I would like to uh, stretch uh, that uh, uh, sensitive data are not uh, only medical data or personal data. Uh, we can have uh, business uh, secrets or other type of uh, data that are uh, important uh, not to disclose uh, to everyone, but uh, uh, at our university uh, we are primarily working uh, with data from uh, uh, health and uh, life sciences. And uh, handling of uh, sensitive data is also one of the uh, goals of uh, CERIT uh, CS and uh, IFRA, INFRA CZ. So that's uh, about uh, our motivation. Uh, what uh, we are doing uh, uh, for this, uh, we have uh, infrastructure that uh, we call uh, sensitive cloud and uh, this uh, infrastructure is uh, designed and uh, provided for handling uh, sensitive data. Uh, our team uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, selecting a specialist uh, from uh, CERIT CS. Uh, it's uh, not uh, uh, something uh, that's uh, covering uh, uh, our uh, full institution. So uh, we uh, are building small, uh, small, uh, small infrastructure uh, with uh, uh, emphasis on uh, working uh, with uh, specific types of data and we are cherry picking uh, selected people uh, with uh, concrete skills uh, for building and uh, maintaining this. So we have some uh, technical people that are working on uh, data storage and computational software, taking care, ter uh, taking care of uh, hardware, data networks, data centers, etc. They are uh, taking care not only uh, for this specific uh, infrastructure for sensitive data, but uh, as uh, they are skilled and experts in the area, uh, we are using them uh, also for taking care of this specific infrastructure with uh, specific uh, regulations and uh, uh, tight, uh, more strict uh, uh, processes on uh, working and maintaining, uh, developing, etc. Uh, we uh, are. We also have uh, specialists uh, on compliance and uh, risk management uh, that are needed for uh, this type of uh, service. Uh, what we are uh, 
taking very seriously is uh, service design. We have uh, dedicated uh, people that are working on designing the service, uh, working on the process of communication with the, uh, with the end users uh, to provide them with uh, good uh, user experience. Uh, we also have uh, lawyers uh, for, for consulting uh, legal aspects and uh, we are uh, also trying to uh, provide some, some enhancements uh, uh, on top of the, of the service. Uh, uh, we have colleagues that are uh, doing some kind of research in this area on uh, topics uh, like uh, forensic readiness. So it's something that uh, provides us uh, uh, important uh, information for day-to-day -day operation, but also uh, provides uh, uh, opportunities for improvements uh, of the infrastructure in the security area. As I mentioned, uh, we have uh, dedicated people that are working on uh, environment design as uh, higher security is uh, usually uh, uh, is, uh, going uh, with uh, worse uh, user experience. Uh, the security measures uh, provide some barriers for users on uh, working uh, with their data on using, uh, using the service. Uh, but uh, we are trying to uh, provide uh, experience as good uh, as uh, possible. Uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, user uh, interviews and uh, testing, testings. Uh, we developed some kind of semi-formal framework uh, of uh, onboarding process uh, where we have uh, defined step of uh, first contact uh, where we are trying to identify what uh, what uh, the user needs and whether it's uh, really uh, useful to use sensitive cloud or they uh, in fact need some other other type of service or infrastructure as uh, their use case is uh, not uh, uh, not matching uh, what uh, we are providing. Uh, we have some uh, environment description. Uh, it's uh, important for uh, users uh, if they uh, if they are doing uh, data management and uh, preparing, for example, data management plan uh, for some uh, project, uh, they uh, appreciate if uh, they have a detailed description of the environment uh, they can uh, use for the uh, description of the uh, processing their data and uh, it's uh, then uh, used by reviewers of the project, whether it, uh, it's... Uh, com uh, it's uh, uh, aligned with the needs of uh, the type of data they uh, they use. Uh, we have uh, some uh, contract templates uh, for the service, uh, etc. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's uh, the motivation and uh, what we are doing for the design and uh, what uh, sensitive cloud uh, is uh, on the technical level. Uh, if you have uh, Sensitive data, uh, you in fact uh, does not need just uh, data storage, as uh, very secure data storage is fine, but uh, it's uh, use, use uh, less if you uh, need uh, to do anything with data. If you have uh, sensitive data, you usually uh, need to analyze them or uh, maybe uh, conduct uh, some research with uh, other people, you need to cooperate uh, on them. If you just uh, have some uh, safe uh, and uh, you are unable to work with data, it's uh, useless. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you copy your data from the secure storage uh, to your laptop or uh, to some uh, insecure environment, uh, you provide uh, risk uh, to them. So the uh, idea of uh, the sensitive cloud is to provide a secure environment that combines uh, uh, data storage and uh, computational uh, resources, so in uh, so you can work complex, uh, you can uh, do complex processing uh, in the single environment, and the uh, data don't uh, leave uh, this uh, secure environment. Uh, as of now, uh, the sensitive uh, cloud uh, compute part uh, is uh, based on uh, Kubernetes. So uh, it, mm, you have uh, containers, you can uh, uh, provide, uh, you can prepare your own uh, images uh, with uh, your appliances and uh, work with them. 
but we are also trying uh, to provide prepared uh, applications ready to use uh, to the users like uh, Air Studio, uh, Jupyter Notebook, uh, and other type uh, of these applications uh, that are ready to use uh, by the users. Uh, data storage uh, is uh, integrated and accessible uh, in the containers, so you can uh, pr uh, work with your data in this uh, closed environment. And uh, this uh, all is on a separated uh, network. Uh, we have uh, our own uh, dedicated uh, uh, VPN uh, based on uh, current uh, best standard uh, Vargard. Uh, we have uh, mandatory uh, multi-factor authentication. Uh, the server uh, components hardware uh, is uh, not only in the data centers, but uh, uh, secured uh, with uh, dedicated, uh, dedicated locks. And uh, not uh, everyone uh, who is uh, able to reach the data center is allowed uh, to uh, go uh, to the hardware, etc. So it's... Uh, uh, completely isolated uh, from uh, other environments. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some users uh, uh, still uh, prefer for uh, some computations, uh, uh, not uh, containers, uh, but uh, full, full uh, virtual machines. So uh, we are also uh, thinking about uh, these use cases. Uh, the security uh, is uh, based on uh, the current uh, best practices. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, we are now uh, ISO uh, 27K uh, certif uh, certified, and uh, the, this is, uh, we think, a good uh, base uh, standard uh, on, uh, for uh, information protection. Uh, uh, but uh, as I uh, said, uh, we are doing also some uh, research uh, on uh, this. So it's a good standard uh, that uh, we consider the basic requirement and uh, we think that uh, any compliant, uh, correct uh, solution must be compliant uh, with uh, this, but uh, we are uh, thinking uh, about more uh, possibilities uh, in this area. Uh, I mentioned uh, forensic readiness. Uh, uh, this. Uh, is focusing on uh, preparation of uh, uh, locks and uh, other uh, other things uh, that can be used uh, when some incident happen. So we are in advance trying to prepare our infrastructure to be sure that we have uh, enough uh, information uh, that uh, will be needed uh, for uh, for investigating uh, if anything wrong happens and uh, we are trying uh, to be sure as uh, we have some formal uh, formal uh, things uh, that uh, provide enough uh, information uh, for uh, the investigation of uh, any incident uh, for example data tracing uh, we uh, did some uh, simulation scenario uh, when some simulated incident happened on the infrastructure and uh, we are then comparing uh, whether the information needed uh, for the investigation of the problem were really uh, in place and uh, our uh, expectations uh, were, were matched. So that's something uh, we are trying to uh, do to improve uh, our uh, environment. Uh, as you uh, probably know, security is not a product, that's uh, a process, a uh, continuous uh, process of planning, monitoring and improvements. Uh, so uh, we are uh, still thinking about uh, possible risks and uh, how to uh, improve it. Uh, we are in the process of uh, acquiring uh, new, new projects that uh, provide us uh, with uh, possibilities of extension of uh, hardware or uh, new, new integrations. And uh, as of now, uh, we are also thinking about uh, Sensitive Cloud uh, 2.0 or 3.0. As I mentioned, uh, some uh, users uh, have use cases uh, that uh, uh, can uh, benefit uh, from uh, uh, full virtual machines or uh, other uh, types. We are thinking about full virtual desktops uh, when uh, the user 
is uh, getting just something like a uh, remote desktop uh, connection, but uh, with uh, no options for data sharing, clipboard sharing, or something like this, and uh, he uh, will not get anything uh, on uh, his uh, computer except for screenshots of uh, the desktop uh, that's uh, completely uh, running uh, in isolated uh, environment and all the data uh, available only, only in the isolated uh, environment. We are also thinking whether it could be useful to provide uh, users with dedicated instances of uh, Kubernetes for OpenStack uh, that uh, could be built uh, on, on demand. But uh, that's something we are uh, thinking, uh, not uh, anything uh, that's uh, now ready, ready to use. So uh, that was a few words about uh, our infrastructure and uh, what uh, can be uh, possible uh, use cases uh, for this. Uh, one uh, of uh, this uh, is uh, GDI or FEGA uh, and uh, infrastructure and tool set for uh, sharing and processing uh, genomic uh, data. Uh, maybe you have heard about uh, projects or, uh, or uh, in its initiatives uh, like uh, One Million Genome uh, that's uh, initiative uh, on uh, creation of infrastructure uh, for uh, secure access uh, to genomic uh, data across Europe. It started uh, now, f uh, sorry, uh, something happened, yeah, sorry. Uh, inf uh, that's infrastructure that uh, started uh, almost a decade, uh, decade ago. Uh, uh, there was a uh, uh, H2020 uh, project uh, beyond one million genome uh, that was uh, focusing on concept of uh, testing phase and uh, uh, provide uh, legal and technical guidance uh, and uh, standard uh, standards on processing uh, genomic uh, uh, genomic material. And uh, as of now, uh, there is a European genomic data infrastructure that's a project uh, of uh, Digital Europe uh, co-founded by uh, member states. And uh, this is uh, uh, trying to continue these efforts and uh, provides uh, uh, infrastructures across uh, the Europe uh, for working with uh, genomic data. Uh, the goals of uh, this infrastructure is to uh, enable access uh, to genomic data and do it in the federated and sust sustainable state and of course uh, in a secure uh, way as uh, genomic data are uh, definitely uh, sensitive uh, data. Uh, it's uh, trying to uh, fulfill uh, the vision of uh, one uh, million uh, genome uh, project and uh, as of now, uh, there are uh, 24 partners uh, across uh, 20 uh, European countries. Uh, I'm uh, very sorry, I don't think uh, the map is uh, completely up to date. So uh, I think uh, in the map is uh, less uh, than uh, 20 uh, countries uh, highlighted, but uh, uh, the current state uh, are 20 countries and uh, primary use is uh, for uh, clinicians. Uh, the member states uh, provide a uh, uh, node uh, or data center uh, in, the, in the network and uh, important thing that uh, each country is uh, managing uh, their own data at the national or uh, regional uh, level. Uh, the nodes uh, also make sure they, they provide uh, cross-border access uh, to, the, to the data uh, via, via API, and uh, there are five uh, main functions. The data discover discovery uh, to provide you information that the data are uh, available and uh, where they were available. Uh, access management, uh, uh, some kind of AI uh, to provide access just to uh, the allowed uh, users. Uh, they provide uh, processing capacities uh, for analyzing uh, the data and uh, storage uh, interfaces uh, and uh, data uh, reception. Uh, the 
GDI technical solution uh, consists of uh, several components. Uh, and uh, here in the Czech Republic, uh, it, uh, it's worth to know, uh, uh, it's worth to uh, note uh, that uh, we are providing uh, uh, AI infrastructure for provide access and uh, we are also pro uh, providing computational via uh, containers and uh, other countries are providing uh, other, other parts of this. Uh, uh, the last year, in the summer of the last year, there was uh, all Allhands uh, meeting uh, where uh, these components uh, were, uh, there was some starter, starter kit. Uh, so uh, there are the components, uh, data, uh, ex uh, data discovery uh, is uh, done uh, from a kind of a catalog and uh, AI infrastructure is used uh, to uh, secure the access uh, management uh, to the data. Uh, data discovery uh, is uh, done uh, via uh, implementation of a beacon. Uh, the, then uh, data access management uh, is also connected uh, with uh, AI infrastructure. And uh, uh, then you can uh, get uh, to the uh, storage. Uh, where uh, uh, data uh, reception is uh, done through uh, HTSGET uh, tool uh, to the uh, processing uh, infrastructure uh, when uh, you uh, can do some computations of on the on the data. Uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, we expect uh, three uh, FEGA, FEGA nodes. Uh, the uh, the process of uh, creating a uh, node uh, consists of uh, technical and uh, processing parts. Uh, the legal aspect, aspect, aspects are, are described uh, on uh, FEGA, uh, FEGA onboarding. Uh, each uh, node uh, uh, implement, uh, implement pipelines, uh, help desks, uh, export of uh, metadata and uh, other things and uh, uh, sensitive cloud infrastructure uh, is uh, going to be, to be use, used uh, for uh, infra, uh, as infrastructure for uh, one of uh, these, uh, these nodes. Uh, the simple tool uh, to see uh, what uh, FEGA about is a maturity uh, level model. Uh, where uh, you have uh, uh, some uh, areas of interest uh, that uh, have to be fulfilled to implement uh, the node. It uh, consists of uh, uh, some kind of business strategy, uh, legal aspects, uh, data and uh, metadata management, technical infrastructure, operational support, and uh, communications uh, with uh, other things uh, for each of these sections, you have uh, several uh, points uh, with uh, different uh, levels of maturity and uh, you can use it uh, as kind of checklist uh, what's uh, needed to be done to implement the node. And uh, the, uh, the process of uh, onboarding to the FEGA is uh, illustrated uh, by this uh, schema and it's uh, available at the uh, FEGA uh, site. So uh, to sum it up, uh, we have uh, infrastructure for sensitive uh, data. And it's uh, up and uh, running and uh, having uh, several processes and uh, that's continuous uh, process of uh, improvements. Uh, we are trying to uh, improve uh, every, every month <laughs> and uh, we uh, are working on the implementation of uh, FEGA. And uh, that's it. If you have any questions, I will try to answer them. So we still have a time for questions. Besides, some, someone will ask uh, if, if you can say a few words about the User communities which are already onboarded in in uh, yeah. sensitive cloud. Yeah. Uh, user user communities uh, are mm, 
spreading of different use cases. Uh, uh, we have, for example, uh, uh, researchers uh, from economy that are uh, working on uh, some sensitive data and analyzing them uh, with uh, Air Studio. Uh, in the infrastructure, we have also GPU uh, accelerators. So we have some uh, groups uh, that are working on uh, implementation of uh, 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 AI uh, on uh, medical data and accelerating uh, the computations of, on this. Uh, so mainly, uh, mainly life sciences, but not only. Um, while you're using this uh, complete web interface, other things also like uh, for the security of data, like like taking the example of Galaxy probably, is there any special security things or you're trying to do for the sensitive data? Because completely involved, it's Galaxy is completely a web-based one. Uh, what, what do you mean beacon or? So like ba basically while dealing with sensitive data, like basically you're trying to deal with all for the sensitive data or make it more se like secure, that's the idea of what you're trying to do. Like uh, for the Galaxy, which is completely on the web interface, uh -huh. Is there anything special, uh, specific you're trying to do or how you're doing? Uh, uh, our um, primary uh, goal is uh, to provide completely isolated environment. Uh, so uh, we are trying uh, not to provide uh, access uh, to the service uh, from uh, not only public internet, but uh, also from uh, uh, institutions. Uh, so if uh, you are working on uh, your project, uh, we want all the users uh, to be uh, part of the project and using our access methods like uh, dedicated uh, VPN, etc. Uh, yeah, uh, we have some uh, uh, groups uh, that are uh, thinking about uh, running, for example, Galaxy and uh, mm, thinking about uh, providing access to the interface of the Galaxy to, uh, on, uh, for the service running uh, for their project uh, for groups. But uh, as of now, uh, the teams are not uh, as big, uh, uh, not to be able to uh, incorporate them uh, to the internal team of the project and providing uh, them a standard uh, access. So just last question, uh, can a user also have their own instance of Galaxy or only you're providing your instance? Uh, it, uh, it's uh, running uh, inside the infrastructure, so we are providing the, the access. Of course, uh, on the level of uh, Galaxy, they can uh, further, uh, further restrict access uh, to just part of the team or if what, what they need. Well, the question was whether they, they, they could deploy their own version of Galaxy. Yeah, definitely, or, or definitely, not. yeah. Okay, another question? If not, let's thank the speaker again. And, <laughs> well, and we are moving to last presentation before the lunch break. So, ladies and gentlemen, my name is František Řezníček, and I will show you something about the OpenStack, about the infrastructure as a service cloud. If it goes well, hopefully. Okay. So, for today, we have on the agenda that we will briefly talk about the compute portfolio we have. So. We have heard about the grids, we have heard about the uh, uh, sensitive cloud, and I, I will just summarize the rest. Then we will learn what to expect from the OpenStack cloud. We find the optimal way of deploying infrastructure there. And finally, I will show you an uh, optimal way how to do it. So, uh, 
Many of you were here also yesterday. You should have a view what's the compute portfolio of, of e-infra CISA. So it's definitely the, uh, th those are the grids. If you have a computation which is short-lived or uh, you simply basic, you can define the, the time frame for your comp computation, you are likely submitting grid jobs where you are defining a wall time. If you want something else, so if you want a service which, which runs in indefinitely, for example, then you have other options. Uh, the next one is the infrastructure as a service. I, I will explain in, in, short, in short time what that means. Uh, that's open stack based cloud where you play with the virtual servers, virtual networks, block storage, object storage, load balancers, etc. So you are defining the infrastructure for, for your computations. And finally, there, there are two uh, Kubernetes clouds. First, was, uh, first is the general, general uh, container cloud, which is uh, playing with application containers or bundles of, of uh, application blocks. And the final one was just mentioned before before this talk this this is sensitive cloud also based on kubernetes so let's stop for a second or for a minute with this picture um, many of you know just uh, briefly uh, i'll try to to briefly summarize how we classify cloud technologies if we look on the right side here we can see Software as a service, all the rectangles are blue. That means that you just configure the application and you, you are done. So for example, that could be GitLab or Slack or whatever. Yeah? Uh, once we move to the left side, we, we enter platform as a service where the two, two rectangles you need to take care of. Then the container as a service, three rectangles. And finally, infrastructure as a service, which is based on, on, on OpenStack. So we can say that as we move from right to, less, uh, to left, we have more ways how to deploy and configure the, the infrastructure. And also, that comes with the higher effort, because you need to simply specify all those blank boxes. And the vice versa going from left to right. You have more standard ways. You, uh, you do not have such a flexibility for, uh, for doing everything you're on your own. But that comes with the benefit of smaller effort. So you are, in fact, uh, able to deploy your infrastructure quicker. That's very important because we can see that now, nowadays in, in business, in, in IT, uh, Almost all, all the people, all the companies are, have moved at least to container as a service or platform as a service. So, let's talk about the OpenStack. What it is? OpenStack is uh, in infrastructure as a service, so you're playing with the servers, block storage, etc., as I already said, uh, and your computation tasks needs to be included into deployed or virtual service, uh, virtual servers. That means that the cloud uh, provisions for you the virtual servers, and you need to make sure that your application uh, gets, gets there. Uh, in Infra CZ, we have two type of projects you, you may use. First one is, is, the, is the free tier personal project. There is just a little of resources, a little of cloud resources uh, for trying it out. And the group projects where all the uh, computation on, on the GPUs, for example, takes place. So everything which is, which is in the production lives in the group project. So that was, that was a high level point of view. Inside OpenStack, it's much more complicated than that, just this picture, yeah? So not, not scaring you, but I, I would like to show you the way that you do not need to care about all the entities which are, in fact, under the hood. 
So when we start, um, when we start to deploy the infrastructure, you, you, we need to ask ourselves at least three questions. First one is that do we need the infrastructure scalable? Second, do we need reproducible infrastructure? And do, do we also need uh, be able, be, do, we, uh, uh, do we want to have a chance to, to dele delegate the, the infrastructure to someone else, that someone else can take care of it? So if you do not care at the, be uh, at the beginning about all those three questions, you may use any way of interacting with the OpenStack. Once you start to have a clear view that you need all those SRD, then you need to pick the proper way of, of communicating, a proper way of working with the OpenStack. So what are the, what are the ways? The first intuitive way is to use the uh, graphical user interface dashboard called Horizon. There you can see visually what ha you have created in the, op in the OpenStack. You can learn something about how it is connected, but it's not, it's neither scalable, neither re nor reprodu uh, repro reproducible. And it's very difficult to hand it over to someone else because it's on 10 or 15 web pages and you need to draw a picture simply. So the next, the next ways are using the uh, command line access. That the command line access relies on client-server API uh, communication. If you start from, from the green field, from the real scratch, you need to understand all those terms here on the picture. There is a better way. You can use predefined templates of infrastructure, which I will show you in a minute. And then you do not need to understand from the day one everything. You are, you are slowly ramping up and learning what is important there. And what, how is it done? It's done using the technology called Terraform, which we jump into right now. So what is Terraform? Terraform is a tool originally by HashiCorp, <laughs> nowadays in IBM. And the uh, Terraform helps you to define infrastructure uh, de declared in the set of text files. Terraform, using the, the Terraform providers, can speak many clouds. So it's multi-cloud, so you can you can play with the OpenStack, or with, with the AVS, AWS, or whatever you want to. Uh, Terraform reads the infrastructure declaration and speaks to the cloud via the API. Um, once, once it's done, eventually Terraform succeeds and dumps the Terraform infra infrastructure state. Uh, that's really important to to highlight that the state gives you the chance to guarantee the life cycle of all the entities inside the cloud. So you can imagine in the cloud there are thousands, thousands of virtual machines, hundreds of networks. So Terraform, via this uh, uh, infrastructure state, is able to, to see what the uh, entities were created by, by, by the Terraform, simply. So, how the architecture, how the typical architecture looks like. So this, this is one of the most, most used architectures in the OpenStack projects. You can have it there, two-tier architecture with the HPC nodes, which are on the internal network, and the Bastion, or sometimes called Jump VM, which is which is also connected to the uh, to the private cloud network, but also have one public IP address, or multiple. Uh, this architecture is uh, we are able to do it very easily, which I'm gonna to show you, and you can find here down that there is a link. 
to the code on the next five slides. So you, if you want to, you can, you could, uh, you can write it down and, and try it. So, the workflow looks like that you need to have some, some tools. We have narrowed, narrowed down the, the needed tools for you for just the container engine, container runtime, and Git. You need to, at, st at step two, you need to get the credentials from OpenStack. You configure the, the infrastructure in few text files, something like two text files. You test the connection and deploy. Finally, when you are done, you can destroy it as well. So in more detail, how to get to, uh, how to clone the Git repository, there's address. And also uh, a few details how to select, how to log in and select your, your project and getting your application credentials. Application credential is something like a, a pair user password, but it's much better because you can, you can make the application credential valid for a certain amount of time and you can define the roles uh, specific for example, lower roles than you have. So, uh, at, at step three, we want to edit the, the configuration of the infrastructure. There you can, you can see uh, variables like Terraform name or notes count or notes flavor. That, it's, uh, there are much more than, th than those three. And those are allowing you to scale the infrastructure. So for instance, you can, uh, for the first time, you can run with the nodes count. Nodes count means how much HPC nodes are there. A nodes count equal to five, and then you, you see, ah, I need another 10 students, so you, you increase it to 15 and, and rebuild again. And then finally, Eight of those students were, are gone. You do not need those eight, eight machines. So you, you come down to seven or eight and uh, uh, rescale again. And finally, uh, there, there is prepared container image which contains all the tools needed for, uh, for, uh, for connecting or working with the, with the OpenStack. So there is Terraform. Uh, OpenStack clients and all the tools you need it. And uh, infra, infra action script which, which does the actions for you. So summarizing, maybe we will have a time to, to do it, to look into the code. To summarize the infrastructure in your workstation, you need to have browser terminal, uh, runtime, a container runtime and, and downloaded the Git repository. And then everything's, everything is, uh, is working for you. So let me, let me show more the code. So we have already said that uh, there are multiple, okay, maybe. Okay. I have shown you on one of those slides that the uh, OpenStack VM um, is uh, linked to to different entities. So I'll I'll get back there. So so this this was a scary scary slide. So we can see here that there is some, some firewall called security group. There is network, uh, SSH, pubkey, and uh, image, etc. So if we look uh, into the Terraform, we will see, see the same. We will see the same. We will see the resource. We will see how many of them we need, how the name, the operating system which we will, will be using, uh, how much uh, CPUs and memory will will contain 
will link the pop key and the security groups. And finally, the network. Here you can see that the infrastructure is uh, declared. The declaration here is really important, not just for you, but also for your colleagues, because they want to have a simple uh, declarative description so they can easily understand what you've been doing there in the cloud. So it's, it's ready for being delegated to someone else. So, so, and so the takeaways are, we have touched the portfolio, we have seen their grids and clouds. In the clouds, we, uh, we have multiple of them, some of them working with the VMs, like infrastructure as a service, some of them contain, container as a service. Uh, I've showed you uh, how to model the infrastructure in the OpenStack, how to access the OpenStack uh, with, the risk, with, with, uh, with the three questions in your head, whether you want to have the infrastructure, infrastructure scalable, uh, reproducible, and delegable. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm showing here the code where you can see where you can see the complete cloud example that you can really reuse. That's for my talk. Are there any questions? The first question on Slido is, you, you, you have said somewhere that there are different plugins in Terraform for different infrastructures. So the question was whether it, it, it is usable with VMware or whether it is usable with just plain host, whether you are able to just deploy it on local host. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, there are plenty of providers and uh, VMware is on the list and the local machine is on the list as well. So um, basically anything you can, you can think of is there. It's really dynamic. So you can, you can see that not all of them are working perfectly. Right? I cannot guarantee it, you will be satisfied, but a lot of things is there already. And it's pretty much stable in terms of Terraform itself and OpenStack provider. Okay, so plenty of time for questions, so. Yeah, one more at least. <laughs> I will not move anywhere. People are probably hungry, or? Uh, maybe I was just not uh, watching carefully enough. So the, this, uh, the Terraform, you had there a slide where the Terraform was uh, like, it's a service, or is it a set of commands that I can install locally? Yeah, thank, thank you. So the Terraform is a local application. Yeah, so if you want to make it uh, GitOps way, you need to see uh, that will redeploy the infrastructure again and again, which is, which is done frequently as well. So, so then you can have a Git repository where uh, the infrastructure is declared there and the CI on every change or periodically will deploy it. So tiny application, something like that, go like this. Yeah. There is one question related to the um, overhead of using the cloud. It's probably meant to, to, to for the real computations and overhead which can be measured. But if, if you are running the command or computations on bare metal or inside the OpenStack. Well, great question. So the next speaker is, will, will speak about the uh, containers. And uh, there is, the containers are definitely better because the, there, there is just one kernel. So uh, speaking of uh, infrastructure as a service, virtual machines, you lose something like 10 to 15% of, of the of the computation because because of the let's say ten percent because of the virtualization in there. Mm -hmm. This way. 
So Plan it's not plenty of time, not moving anywhere. One more. But you are staying here so till afternoon, so, so you have plenty of chance to, 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 to ask okay. him <laughs> offline. Thanks to all for active presence. For before the lunch, we have a lunch break now. It's probably on the same place right yes, yesterday, so two possibilities to go for, for lunch uh, downstairs, and we continue 1.30 here.